Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being here. My name is Farka Benkert. I'm a faculty member here in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, and I'm also on the Board of Directors for Genocide Awareness Week. And before we start, uh, let me also give a, a big shout out to our chair um, of um, um, the Board of Directors, that's uh, Tim Langill. Um, uh, he's really doing uh, the bulk of all the work here. Um, so without him, nothing would work. And and uh, we're very, very uh, um, uh, uh, you know uh, proud and and happy that that he brings us, us all together. So one thing that is important for us in, in Genocide Awareness Week is that we bring uh, different scholars and working on different genocides in conversation with each other. Um, so uh, and today. We um, bring two uh, scholars on uh, the Armenian Genocide, but also on the Holocaust um, together in conversation on the topic of denial, which is sadly a, a, an issue that I think marks all genocides. There is a, a period of, of, uh, of denial. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Paolo de, uh, de Mugadeshian as well as uh, Dr. Sarah Krishman um, to Arizona State University. We will have uh, you know, kind of two presentations and then uh, we will get together for questions and, and answers. So uh, let me first introduce um, Professor uh, Dermo Uh He has been uh, teaching Armenian and Armenian studies courses for 38 years at California State University, Fresno. Uh, he is the Barbarian uh, um, Coordinator of the Armenian Studies Program and the Director of the Center for Armenian Studies. He is also a very generous donor um, to Genocide Awareness Week. We are very, very grateful for, for your support um, and for you being here. Um, so um, he is the editor of the Armenian series uh, of the press at uh, California State University, and he has published a whooping 17 books in that uh, series. Um, and he teaches courses uh, in the Armenian language, history, culture, and of course, the genocide. So welcome. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here. Thank you. And thank the organizers, uh, Genocide Awareness Week. Uh, I've been involved since almost the beginning of Genocide Awareness Week, some 10, 11 years ago. So it's always a pleasure to be able to, to come and to give uh, a talk. And in this case, to be able to be in conversation uh, today. And what we decided to do is each of us is going to give a 10 to 15 minute presentation, mine probably closer to 15 minutes, uh, on denial, and then we'll, we'll engage each other in a conversation. So it's going to be kind of a whirlwind. I'm going to uh, show you some slides, some things I'm going to read, most I won't read. But afterward, if anyone would like to have those slides, I will share them with you. That's no problem uh, at all. So today the topic is going to be uh, the denial of the Armenian Genocide. And first of all, just again, what is the Armenian Genocide? Uh, I'm defining it as a series of events between 1915 and all the way up until 1923, which resulted in the death of over a million and a half Armenians. Now, we can think of the uh, genocide as being multidimensional, and some of that has to do with what I'm going to be talking about with denial. But if you take a look at number two, policy of mass murder through deportation, Number four, economic expropriation of property and other forms of wealth, and then also cultural genocide. All of these are continuing forms, which in a sense, the denial also comes in through those forms as well as we're gonna take a look at them. So for me, genocide denial implies state denial of the genocide. And we're gonna uh, talk today about uh, both Ottoman Turkey, but also the Republic of Turkey because I think of it as the successor state to the Ottoman Empire, and the policies taken by the state of Turkey to deny the Armenian genocide, the formal, the formal policies that uh, constitute denial. And what I've done today, and this is how I'm gonna organize it, is to look at five periods in the history uh, since 1918. Uh, each period I'm gonna talk about briefly to show you the evolution of denial uh, as denial has gone through its various stages. So uh, the first stage is the immediate post-war until the establishment of the Republic of Turkey. That's number one. Number two is the period of Republic of Turkey under Kemal Ataturk until his death in 1938. Three is uh, the period 1938 to 1975, uh, when among the significant events was Turkey joining NATO and signing the Genocide Convention. 
Number four is the active phase of the denial of genocide. So in a sense, one through three uh, are going to be the period when genocide denial was in kind of in a passive or silent period. I'll explain why, with some notable exceptions. But after that, after 1975, uh, the state, Turkey, takes on an active phase of denial of the genocide. And then uh, 2003 represents another period, which is really the era of the prime minister and later president of Turkey, Erdogan. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let's take a look at the first period, 1918 to 1923. And really, it's what I have in blue that, that is going to be the, the key aspect here. The acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide is seen as threatening to two basic cornerstones of the new narrative of the Republic of Turkey. So in the period between 1918 and 23, between the end of World War I and the establishment of the Republic of Turkey, that five-year period, was a period when a new narrative had to be created uh, along with the creation, ultimately, of the state of Turkey in 1923. And the two points are on the bottom. This, is, this can be seen in a, in a speech given by uh, Kemal Ataturk called the Nutuk, which is kind of the formative speech. It was like a 36-hour speech that he gave, uh, which gives his formal vision of what Turkey is, is going to be. And number one, Turkey is a homogenous state. There are no minorities, only Turks. You can already see a problem there because uh, Armenians are not going to be recognized other than as Turkish subjects or citizens. And number two, Turkey is not connected to the Ottoman, to Ottoman Turkey. So there's somehow a rupture. There's no explanation. It's kind of a, a, a black hole between 1918 and 23, because Turkey in 1923 will say, we're not that state. That was a different state. That's Ottoman Turkey. So in this period, then, uh, it's this development already of denial, which is embedded in the, in the construction of the state of the Republic of Turkey. Number two, 1923 to 38, under Kemal Ataturk, uh, I outline, and I'm not going to read each point, but I outline the processes, the policies, which again embed the denial, again, in the very beginnings of the Republic of Turkey. And I think number one is important. It says many former members of the Committee of Union and Progress, which was actually the political party in power and that executed and ordered the genocide, actually become officials of the new republic. So if you want to argue that you are not connected, but yet members of those old political party now is part of your republic, then you can see how denial becomes embedded because obviously they're not going to want to say that we did something uh, in that earlier period. Another interesting one is number two, when Kemal Ataturk implemented a change in the alphabet. And what he did was order a language change. And what he did was to say that no longer would Ottoman Turkish be written in Arabic script, but rather would utilize Latin characters. And in doing so, it makes it very difficult for anyone learning the new system to be able to read about the history of, of Turkey. And I think that's also a layer of denial uh, that we can look at. And I'm going to uh, go to the next one. Uh, also, for the Armenian question, and that's really what we're talking about is the genocide and what happened to the Armenians. I said Turkey's position is silence. Well, what also contributes to that silence? It's that Turkey began a rapprochement with the West, number four, when European powers saw economic and political ties with Turkey as being beneficial to them, which means that they do not want to raise the issue of genocide in this period because it would affect their relationship with Turkey. And look at the Armenians, number five, those who did survive the genocide are politically weak in their new diaspora and homes, because the question is, who will pursue genocide outside of a place called Armenia? And of course, the word genocide isn't coined until later, but you understand what I'm saying. And then look at number six as well. Uh, many Armenians in Soviet Armenia were not allowed to openly or formally discuss the Armenian genocide, nor to conduct academic research on the topic. So you sum up those six points and you get what? Silence because Turkey doesn't have to respond to anything because there's nothing to respond to. So that's the period of, of silence in the, in the Turkish-Armenian question. Now, one uh, notable exception is an active case of denial. Uh, Franz Werfel's 40 Days of Musada became an international bestseller. It's based on true events of one of the uh, significant successful self-defenses of Armenians at a place called Musada. 
That's the book. It had become in 1934 a US bestseller. So what do you do with a bestseller? You convert it into a movie. MGM bought the rights to make the movie, but the Turkish ambassador to the United States put pressure on MGM and the government to prevent the film from being made, saying that if you make it, we're gonna ban any US films from being shown in, in Turkey. And ultimately the film was not made. So this was an example of active denial of the genocide through uh, official Turkish channels. In 1938 to 1975, uh, we just see a couple of strategic things that are taking place which help to cement denial. One is that Turkey uh, positions itself as anti-communist, therefore becoming closer to the United States, becoming part of NATO in 1952, uh, considered by the US as a bulwark against communism. So would the United States want to upset that apple cart uh, with bringing up the issue of the genocide? They wouldn't, right? Because that's an ally and they don't want to upset that ally and then have them switch sides perhaps and work with, uh, work with the Soviet Union. So the pursuit of the genocide issue that is denial is e actually easy because you don't have to do anything. So it would be difficult to actually pursue it because you don't want to alienate uh, Turkey. And then just a couple of other things here. Um, the, the bottom one says, no country will take up the Armenian cause and bring the issue of the Armenian genocide to the United Nations. So that's the paradox, right? The word genocide is defined and used as a legal term by the United Nations. But in order to bring that term to the United Nations, you have to be a nation. So if you are the Armenians who don't have a nation because you're either in the Soviet Union or now you're in the diaspora, you have no spokesman. You have no way to bring that issue to the international community. And that also contributes to that silence and to the denial of genocide. Ironic, Turkey is among the first countries in the world to sign the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. I find that kind of ironic uh, in a way. All right, so now let's go to 1965. This is a little bit outside the picture I was just talking about, but. 1965 is significant for Armenians in the world because it was the first time in 50 years on the 50th anniversary of the genocide that Armenians spontaneously uh, demonstrated in the streets of Yerevan in Soviet Armenia and were able to bring up the issue of the Armenian genocide. Uh, and our, the Soviet authorities gave permission to the construction of the Armenian Martyrs Monument at Zizernagapet. I'm gonna show you that uh, now in just a moment. And uh, I can also remember myself as a second and third generation Armenian. I'm a third generation Armenian. My grandparents went through the genocide. Uh, we began to also bring the genocide issue into the political arena. So after 1965, Armenians themselves began to now think we have to be our own agents because no other country is going to help us in this struggle. And if you take a look at uh, the genocide monument, here it is. It was completed in 1967. It's in Yerevan, uh, Armenia. Every year, April 24th is considered the day of commemoration of the Armenian genocide. And uh, you can see all those flowers because it's a holiday in the country of Armenia and hundreds of thousands of people will bring flowers and their ceremonies to mark uh, the Armenian genocide day. So in Armenia itself, after 1965, the issue at least among the population was able to be publicly, uh, publicly commemorated. Uh, every year I take, every two years, I take students from my university, Fresno State, to go to the Armenian Martyrs Monument. Uh, and actually there's an Armenian Genocide Institute Museum, which is associated with the monument, which today is one of the foremost uh, scientific academic institutions dealing with the Armenian Genocide. Uh, they have exhibits, they do training, uh, they have scholars. And again, Armenia now is among the leaders in, in the field. I also want to talk about cultural genocide as, a, as an avenue of denial as well, because this, is a, the, this one puts the argument of Turkey saying we're not part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire. So if you're not, then you shouldn't have any problems with the Armenians, right? You shouldn't be doing anything. Well, cultural genocide, as uh, coined by Raphael Lemkin, that is, genocide not only refers to the physical extermination, but also national, spiritual, and cultural destruction. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Um, impact on Armenian literature and language, but really cultural destruction as a continuation of genocide. 
So Turkey has continuously since 1923 targeted Armenian cultural monuments for destruction, denial as a means to complete the genocide. One example, again, is to simply annihilate the memories of the people who created the monuments. And so you destroy the objects of cultural memory. And one example is simply this one. On the left, you see a, a monastery called Chetzkonk. It's from the seventh to 13th century. On the left, you see five, uh, five domes. On the right, you just see one dome left. Uh, this is documented that the Turkish government, the army came in with artillery, intentionally targeting this complex, leaving just that left. What is that but continuation of the policy of denial and uh, trying to erase the Armenian genocide? Now let's go to number four. This is the period from 1975. Silence turns to active denial. And this is where two things are happening. 1975 marked the first time the United States Congress began to consider resolutions regarding the question of the Armenian genocide. That's number one. Same time period, not, not related necessarily, there was a group formed called the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia, which began a campaign of political violence targeting Turkish officials. This was a public campaign of assassination and bombing, which then caused a reaction on the part of Turkey, which is to begin the active phase of their denial pattern. And also in, encompasses getting scholars, uh, encouraging scholars in the United States to work with Turkey to develop denial claims. So there is now an active denialist set of scholars who work to distort, distort or misinform regarding the Armenian genocide. But that's part of the active denial. Uh, which now is very, very prevalent in the United States. Uh, one of the most interesting is 1990 in the second, second bullet point where there was a campaign actually to get a resolution passed in the United States Senate. And there were six hours of debate on the floor of the Senate on the question of the Armenian genocide. The first time such a long period of time was devoted to it. Uh, there was fierce lobbying on the part of the Republic of Turkey, which led to threats of filibuster which means that if you filibuster, you need 60 votes, right? Even more than 50 plus. So uh, the Senate wasn't able to get to 60 votes to overturn that, and therefore the resolution uh, failed. But once again, Turkish and American scholars began a more active denial phase, uh, holding even endowed positions in universities. Uh, and there was uh, an Institute of Turkish Studies, no longer in existence, but it promoted scholarship of denial. And then finally, within Turkey itself, uh, in 2008, a law was passed, a criminal code called Article 301. And any person who publicly denigrates the Turkish nation, the state of the Turkish Republic, or the Grand Assembly of Turkey, and the judicial institutions of the state shall be punishable by imprisonment from six months to two years. And probably many of you remember the high profile cases of Orhan Pamuk and Elif Shafak, who were indicted for this act, meaning that they insulted Turkishness. How is that possible for two uh, authors? Because they alluded to what had happened in 1915, and that was considered an insult against the Turkish nation and the state of the Turkish Republic. Later, both of those crimes were, uh, both of those cases were dropped, but there have been more than 60 cases brought by prosecutors uh, based, on that, uh, based on that law. It's still in existence. I don't think they're applying it very much anymore, but it's again, an important part of the denial phase. Now, the other big area is historiography textbooks. And again, again, asking the question, why does Turkey want to actively deny a genocide to which they say they're not connected because that was the previous state? And the answer is that if you look at uh, textbooks written uh, for Turkish schools, Armenians are invariably uh, positioned or blamed for what happened as as um, as people who caused the genocide, you know, blame the victim for causing that action. Uh, and still today, Armenians are depicted as treacherous and betrayers of the state. And that's the terminology that's used to help deny the genocide. There's no gen genocide because the people that did it, they, they weren't killed. They were the ones causing the problems. So again, you're going to blame uh, blame the victims. 
And then finally, the last, uh, the last part for today is just simply uh, Turkey after 2003. And the election of Prime Minister uh, Erdogan brought significant changes within Turkey. This was discussed a little bit yesterday with Dr. Akcam. One of the first changes was the beginning of the dismantling of the Kemalist state structures. So Kemalism is based on Ataturk and his fundamental speech. So that was the embedding of denial as one part of everything else. And so what the prime minister did was to begin to dismantle that, which actually opened up a space for discussion of the Armenian genocide. And the Armenian genocide actually began to be publicly discussed in the press in Turkey. There were uh, actual uh, demonstrations on April 24th in Istanbul and actually publications in Turkish and Armenian published in Turkey on the Armenian genocide. Of course, some of the publishers got in trouble for that later, but this was an opening right in the first few years of the Erdogan, of the Erdogan uh, prime ministership. But I want to go to number three here, where Erdogan issued a statement. He says, we share the Armenians' pain with sincerity. The doors of our hearts are open to the deceased Ottoman Armenians' grandchildren. Well, that's a, that's a huge statement in this whole picture that we're looking at. But then what did he say? He says he went on to emphasize that not only Armenians had lost their lives, uh, and that there was no genocide. So again, uh, he's doing it, but he's minimizing and distorting as he's doing it. And so I would conclude by saying that the state position of Turkey towards the uh, Armenian genocide has not changed. I'm always talking about official Turkey, so I'm not talking about the population at large. That's a different discussion. And so affirmation of the Armenian genocide is a response to the official policy of the Republic of Turkey the successor of the Ottoman Empire, which is denial of the Armenian genocide. And uh, we can see that again with diplomatic efforts. In 2019, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, United States Congress for the first time passed a resolution on the genocide. And it was again under fierce lobbying, but it did pass. But there are still efforts by Turkey to stop passage of any genocide related resolutions, not only in the United States, but in other countries. So that's my brief overview of the uh, genocide. Thank you. Again, denial. So thank you so much. Um, and it's now my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Sarah Kushman to ASU. Sarah Kushman is the director of the Holocaust Educational Foundation of Northwestern University, and she's also a, a lecturer um, uh, in the history department uh, there. Uh, the Holocaust Education Foundation of Northwestern University uh, advances Holocaust education at the university level throughout the world by supporting scholarship and teaching. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, uh, the Holocaust Educational Foundation also supported a faculty seminar last year here, and we were very, very grateful uh, for your support. It was a wonderful seminar, and it was actually Tim Langell again who uh, secured the, the grant uh, to make that happen. And it was also supported by um, uh, Jewish studies here at ASU, and um, Professor Hava Tuar Samuelson is here, and uh, she is a, also a board member here for Genocide Awareness Week, a longtime supporter of Genocide Awareness Week. Um, and she also supported uh, that um, um, uh, faculty seminar uh, uh, funded also by uh, the Holocaust Educational uh, Foundation. And uh, also Richard Amesbury is here. Um, he's the director of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies, also longtime supporter of Genocide Awareness Week and also of uh, this, um, this faculty workshop last year. Um, so Kushman has been involved in Holocaust education and scholarship for two decades, serving as director of youth education at the Holocaust Memorial Intolerance Center of Long Island, um, and head of educational programming at the Strassler Center for Holocaust education studies, Holocaust and genocide studies at Clark uh, University. She earned her doctorate in Holocaust history from Clark University, which is a wonderful uh, exemplary uh, program of, of, uh, of uh, genocide studies um, here in the country. Uh, and her own research centers on women's experiences during the Holocaust and history of the women's camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And she's currently working on her book, Auschwitz, the Women's Camp, which is an adaptation of her dissertation, 
as well as co-editing the Woodledge Handbook of Auschwitz-Birkenau, which will come out uh, next year. Um, Cushman has written several articles related to this topic, including an overview of the history of the women's camp, an analysis of Jewish women prisoners, uh, women uh, prisoner functionaries, and an exploration of women's experience of sexual violence and sexual agency. In addition, she has written a personal essay about her journey to studying the Holocaust and contribution about the, the place of Primo Levi in the modern Jewish uh, canon. Cushman is co-editor of Holocaust Studies, a journal of culture and history, and serves on the leadership of Out Network uh, Evanston, Northwestern University's faculty slash staff LGBTQ, LGBTQIA plus affinity group. So wonderful uh, to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Professor Beckert, and thank you, Professor Damakushian, uh, for your overview of the denial of the Armenian genocide. I'm really honored to be here today, um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be here. I, re I really appreciate it. Um, I also I attended a, a panel, the panel just prior to this one, and I, I just have to say I was so humbled by um, by the speakers on that panel. Um, you know, we're here uh, and, um, you know, I'm a scholar of this, uh, you know, particular historical atrocity, uh, but it was really important for me to, um, to, to get these reminders that stuff like this is happening all over the world right now. And um, the emotion of the people this morning, it was just really powerful. And um, I just wanted to thank them for, for being here and to share their really, really difficult stories with us. It was, uh, um, um, you know, part of the work I do, sorry, I'm going on a little tangent here. Um, I, part of the work I do is that is in the hope that we can prevent tragedy, these kinds of things from happening in the future. And um, it, sometimes it feels like these attempts are kind of futile, but seeing the people in the room, knowing that there are people online watching um, gives me some hope that, um, that maybe we are actually having uh, an impact. Um, th this topic today um, is not a particular particularly um, hopeful one, um, but uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be here talking about it. Uh, anyways, um, so before I jump into Holocaust denial, I did want to um, acknowledge where this event is taking place in two ways. Um, first, and perhaps this has already happened, but I want to do this again. Uh, Arizona State University's Tempe campus is situated on the ancestral lands of indigenous people, past, present, and future. We thank and honor the Native American tribes and sovereign nations of the Salt River Valley, including the Akamel Oadam, Onk Akamel Oadam, and Pipash nations, whose knowledge and stewardship of the land and waterways allow us to be here today. We also honor the um, all 23 indigenous tribes in Arizona. Um, I should say, I should have prefaced that by saying, I think it is really important that um, when we're talking about uh, mass atrocity, that we acknowledge the mass atrocities that have taken place in our name and in the places where we live and work. Um, so that was um, uh, an effort to do at least that in part to acknowledge uh, um, people who've been here um, longer than, uh, than European settlers and others. Um, the second thing I want to say um, is that Elie Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor, novelist and human rights advocate. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech of 10th December 1986, he said, I swore never to be, this is a quote, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere when human lives are in endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy. That place at that moment must become the center of the universe. Now, we heard about some of the centers of the universe this morning, but I also wanted to say that Arizona is one of many places where human lives are endangered and human, digni and human dignity is in jeopardy. It is profoundly disturbing that some of these threats in Arizona are targeting some of the most vulnerable members of our society, transgender young people. Less than a month ago, the governor of Arizona signed into law a prohibition against gender-affirming health care and a ban on transgender women and girls participating in sports designated for women and girls. He framed this ban cynically, claiming, quote, every young Arizona athlete should have the opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities to give them, a, give them a sense of belonging and allow them to grow and thrive. That's the end of the quote. Every young Arizona athlete, that is, except trans youth. I stand for trans youth, their access to health care and to activities that allow them to grow and thrive. OK, I'm, I'm done with that piece of my talk. I would now turn to uh, Holocaust denial, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, there's a lot to say about this topic, and I have about 10 minutes uh, to share some of my thoughts with you. My plan is to offer a table of contents of sorts, a brief overview. 
I hope to offer a few more details in my discussion with Professor Dermugradugian and to spark some questions from those in the audience uh, watching and listening. Um, oh, I have control of the slide. Sorry, here we go. Wait, oh, where am I pointing it this way? Um, pointing it this way. Pointing it neither way. Can I advance it for you? Sure. Okay. Great. So various groups of scholars have identified stages of genocide. The commonly accepted model uses 10 stages, which are represented as discrete. But any number of these activities can occur at any one time. These stages are not a flowchart, in other words, but rather a method to understand how genocide unfolds, escalates, and radicalizes. But each genocide is, comp is a complex historical event with causes and conditions. Each involves people with varied motivations and responses and intricate social dynamics that ebb and flow. In all models of genocide, the final stage is denial. Denial is a part of genocide and characterizes to some extent all post-genocidal societies. Each genocide is unique but has features common to all genocides. The same is true of denial, the primary manifestation of which is some form of that did not happen and we did not do it. Genocide denial can be, can be similarly complex to genocide and its sources myriad. Next slide. The Holocaust was a genocide, and this is a really busy slide, so apologize for that, but the Holocaust was a genocide against the Jewish people of Europe and North Africa, carried out by the Nazi German state with the collaboration of military, paramilitary, police, and civilian actors in most countries in Europe between 1941 and 1945. There were various precursors and pre-existing conditions that created fertile ground in which the Nazis planted their ideology of hatred and exclusion when they gained power in Germany in 1933. The major tenet of Nazi ideology was German Aryan superiority, an ideology in which anti-Semitism, hatred of Jewish people, stood at the very center. Nazi ideology, however, viewed various groups as troubling to their ideas of national racial unity and impediments to their efforts to align blood and soil, including people with disabilities, Roman Sinti, members of what today we call the LGBTQIA plus community, Jehovah's Witnesses, Slavic peoples, and others. Over the 12 years of Nazi rule, Nazi racial, eugenic, social, and political policies applied first in Germany and later in ever widening regions of Europe where Nazis gained control and allies radicalized from various efforts to segregate, isolate, concentrate, control, and impoverish German Jews and others, to efforts to sterilize, incarcerate, starve, and murder. Mass murder became state policy against people with disabilities in 1939. With the German uh, invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, mass murder of Jews and Soviet commissars evolved into genocide as the Nazis' goal became the annihilation of Jews and Roma and Sinti peoples. Mobile killing squads were the first method of genocide, and eventually the Germans utilized methods first tried on people with disabilities inside Germany. Gas chambers, starvation, lethal injections, to carry out genocide in death camps, Kelmno, Belzec, Sobobor, Treblinka, Majdanek, and of course, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Next slide. Denial, according to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, is discourse and propaganda that deny the historical reality and the extent of the extermination of Jews by the Nazis and their accomplices during World War II, known as the Holocaust or the Shoah. Holocaust denial refers specifically to any attempt to claim that the Holocaust or the Shoah did not take place. I will now turn to a brief history of Holocaust denial, a short discuss discussion of who Holocaust deniers have been and are, and a sample of methods and motivations for Holocaust denial. Denial of the Holocaust began shortly after the genocide began, while World War II, while World War II was still underway. The Nazis aimed to minimize the knowledge of those they targeted of what was happening to them. They deceived victims to minimize resistance. As the end of the war approached, the Nazis destroyed evidence of their crimes by dismantling death camps and burning files. The Germans and their collaborators continued denial after the war. Many German civilians perceived themselves as victims of wartime. Collaborator nations, especially those occupied by Nazi German forces, distanced themselves from genocidal policies. 
In post-war trials, while perpetrators did not deny mass murder of Jews, for the most part, um, and other atrocities, they did deny personal responsibility for killing or hid behind civilian status, if they were indeed civilians. In the mid to late 20th century, outright Holocaust denial was asserted primarily by far-right fringe groups in Europe and North America. Anti-Semites of various stripes claimed on the one hand that the Holocaust did not happen, or that if it did, the numbers of people killed were grossly exaggerated. On the other hand, they avowed that 6 million was not enough. In the late 20th century and early 21st century, there has been a rise in Holocaust denial among Muslim extremist groups who oppose Israel. There's also been an expansion of Holocaust denial into mainstream politics in Europe and North America, with the rise of both, both right-wing populist movements and governments, and the proliferation of anti-Semitic hatred, conspiracy theories, and other forms of xenophobic ha hatred via the internet and social media. Next slide, please. Various groups in various times have denied the Holocaust, including Nazis, Germans, and their collaborators during World War II, the German Federal Republic in the wake of the Second World War, collaborator nations and other nations more recently who during the war opportunistically moved against Jewish citizens in their countries, and neo-Nazis, far-right groups, anti-Semites, and conspiracy theorists not involved or only tangentially involved in state governments. Let's now look at some of the methods and motivations behind Holocaust denial. I'll give only a few examples to illustrate some of the ways uh, uh, Holocaust deniers have operated and why. One characteristic of how the Nazis carried out mass murder of Jews was by deceiving Jews about what was happening to them. Jewish people were told they were being relocated to the East for labor when they were actually being deported to killing centers. Some arrival stations at death camps were disguised as regular train stations. Gas chambers were set up to look like showers. Overall, this was an effort to kill more efficiently by reducing resistance and putting forth to those they targeted the idea that cooperation would result in safety. Another wartime form of denial was destruction of evidence. Destruction took forms gruesome and mundane. There was an effort early on to disinter bodies of some of those burnt, buried after mass killings and to burn them to minimize the evidence. Often Jewish men were forced to carry out these horrific tasks. The death camps of Belzec, Sobobor, and Treblinka were dismantled and made to look like farms rather than genocidal structures. During the last few weeks before the evacuation of the Auschwitz camp complex in January 1945, prisoner laborers were forced to burn camp records in the crematoria that had previously been used to burn the bodies of those killed in the adjacent gas chambers. Another form of denial was that German civilians came to view themselves as victims, particularly toward the end of the war. We must recognize that the firebombing of German cities was terrorizing and the mass rape of German women by allied uh, forces, particularly Red Army, was, were horrific events. Both were mass atrocities. Shortly after the war, many Germans experienced hunger or starvation and allied occupation of Germany only exacerbated their feelings of victimization. Many Germans were unable to see beyond their own suffering to what their government had done in their name to civilians across Europe, particularly Jewish civilians. Denial in Germany, particularly in the German Federal Republic, West Germany, continued after the war. West Germany, um, sorry, West Germany resisted denazification and in the 1950s exhibited little will to prosecute war criminals, either those living in Germany or those who had fled to other parts of the world. Many Nazis remained in civil service and judicial positions. The West Germans' wish to avoid responsibility was aided by the Cold War. Very shortly after the end of World War II, the Western world turned from efforts to tame Nazism to try to curb the spread of communism. Nazis found themselves easily able to slip into German society undetected. I should say that Germany um, eventually came to be one of the few nations that has actually acknowledged their, their role in genocide and taken responsibility for it. Um, that came really only with the coming of age of the grandchildren of the perpetrators in the 1960s and, and 1970s. Nations that ha had either collaborated with the Nazi regime, like France, or who had opportuni opportunistically used the genocidal context of the war to solve their own Jewish question, like Poland, found little reason to claim responsibility for participation in genocide. They denied their own responsibility. With attention on Germany, 
France was able to assert a national identity of resistance and Austria asserted an identity as the first victims of the Nazis. Austria was after all the first country the Nazis annexed. As we now know, France voluntarily rounded up some Jews in France before the German occupation regime asked them or required them to do so. And most Austrians welcomed the annexation, not only with cheers, but also with immediate public humiliation of thousands of Jews. The relationship between Poland and the Holocaust has always been contentious and complex. While, Poles, sorry, uh, while millions of Poles were murdered by the Nazi regime, millions of Polish Jews were murdered as part of the Nazi genocidal campaign because they were Jews, not because they were Poles. And while Poland did not generally collaborate with the occupation regime, significant portions of the Polish population engaged in anti-Semitic violence or support, supported those who did. Many in Poland have underplayed Polish anti-Semitism, and recently the far-right party in power, the Law and Justice Party, uh, discouraged and at one point criminalized portraying Poland as other than a nation of rescuers, distorting and minimizing the annihilation of Jews. Next slide. Anti-Semites and far-right groups, as well as conspiracy theorists and others, picked up the mantle of Holocaust denial in the 20th century. For most of the 20th century, Holocaust denial and distortion remained characteristic only of a fringe element. The Holocaust had made anti-Semitism anathema to most democratic societies. There were some efforts in the 70s and 80s to make denial more palatable. Um, some deniers who had ties to academia, including one at Northwestern, my home university, asserted that the Holocaust was exaggerated, that numbers were debatable, that gas chambers were not gas chambers, that Hitler did not know what was going on, even if millions of Jews were killed by his regime. They sowed seeds of doubt that took hold despite, despite mountains of evidence that any reasonable person could only interpret as genocide. The Holocaust is by far the most well-documented genocide in history. However, with the Holocaust receding into history, the passing of the survivor generation and technological advancements that make misinformation more easily accessible than accurate information, Holocaust denial and distortion are proliferating. They are exacerbated by economic insecurity, wealth disparity resulting from globalization, which also contributes to feelings of xenophobia and the melding of all of those forms of, uh, of um, anti-Semitism with classical anti-Semitism, which asserts a global Jewish conspiracy. <laughs> Let me reiterate that, that Holocaust denial is a form of anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jewish people as Jews, and the belief in hateful stereotypes about Jewish people. Unfortunately, Holocaust denial is becoming more of an issue rather than less of one. This has something, I, I, I think, to do with anti-Semitism, uh, which seems to function differently or in a more global context than hatreds and fears that lie at the center of other genocides. We can discuss this more um, in the next segment of, of our discussion. I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I uh, would like to open it for questions, and and if, if uh, you could engage each other too, we would we would love to hear uh, parallels, perhaps. And, and I, I already think I, I found a lot of, of parallels for how you can engage the two genocides and denial around them together. But please, uh, Tim, yes, I have a question for Barlow. Uh, could you speak to uh, what's going on in Karabakh, Karabakh, Artsakh? and uh, its legacy with uh, Turkish denial of the Armenian genocide, including, you know, you showed those images of cultural destruction, which is ongoing there. And, you know, with our media focused on Ukraine and many other things, it's, it's, that really doesn't get as much media coverage as it should. So I was wondering if you could talk to those, about those contemporary events and uh, the denial of the Armenian genocide and how it's ongoing in that regard as well. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a complex issue, but uh, we have to start really with Armenians and Azeris under Soviet rule, which is that nationalis, nationalis, nationalities, nationalism was suppressed for so many years. Uh, the issue of the Karabakh land and that area has been an issue since at least the early 1920s, for Armenians at least. Uh, then we just fast forward to the breakup of the Soviet Union, reinstitution or reestablishment of republics. And uh, we go right, you know, it, 
it started right then when the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the issue of the Karabakh land uh, came right up again. And if you look at the rhetoric, if you look at the language that's used by uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan, especially the president, it mirrors very closely what happened uh, to the Armenians in, in 1915. So I think you can make clear connections to an idea of ethnic cleansing. And that is really the only goal that it's very difficult to negotiate when one side is only really intending uh, to do that. But um, it's 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 been a it's been a difficult issue for Armenians, uh, also in the in the cultural sense, as, as you mentioned, because the area of Artsakh, Karabakh, has uh, been an area which, for at least several thousand years, has a very clear Armenian presence through the churches, monasteries, etc., which again have been targeted for uh, demolition, destruction. Uh, I saw it myself personally because I visited uh, that area in 2019, and then. I saw when the war broke out, uh, one of the places that I had been to was completely demolished. So unfortunately, I think we see the repetition of that. And then it's the role of Turkey also, because the modern Republic of Turkey is also aiding the modern Republic of Azerbaijan in that sort of campaign. And I think that is, again, the idea of denial. In other words, if you're, if you're totally really not the same state, why are you so interested in, in continuing that? So... It's it's an important issue. It's an ongoing issue. It's a contemporary issue, which I think has its roots going back to the genocide. Thank you. Yes, please. So um, regarding to uh, Ms. Cushman, Dr. Cushman, um, regarding to uh, the genocide steps going into genocide, I was wondering, could you possibly relate the steps and North America's current state? Because um, I have noticed that there ha we have passed some of those steps. So is that a possibility that it could go into that? The genocide could happen here? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, so it, a lot of what, 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 So generally, generally speaking, um, my understanding is that in, generally speaking, in democratic societies, genocides don't tend not to happen. Um, that said, I think we're living in a in a in a time where there's a lot of activity um, in this country that is um, trying to undermine the democratic institutions that are here. So the protections that are in place. Now, I, I don't mean that to say that the United States has not committed mass atrocity. I, I agree that it has, and we are a country that has not acknowledged those mass atrocities specifically. Um, I would say uh, genocide of um, indigenous peoples and um, and then slavery obviously is is a big one um, among others. Um, but I think we're I think we're in a particular moment here where we have um, uh, we had um, a, a person sitting in the White House who was um, actively participating in undermining democratic institutions, and then we have a lot of people um, in uh, in in our government structure who are actively working against um, to undermine democratic institutions. And if we look at the history of, I think one of the places, one of the things that we can learn from the way that the Nazis achieved power is that, um, so I'll try not to go back too much into history, but it, Hitler's first attempt to, um, to get into power was an attempt to overthrow um, the state government of Bavaria. It was unsuccessful, he was thrown into power, whatever. But what he learned from that is that undermining democratic institutions from inside um, can be a much more effective um, method of doing so. And that's what he did. Um, and, uh, and I think what we see now is people working inside our democratic institutions to undermine their, legit their legitimacy. And by having some people who don't believe in democratic institutions responsible for safeguarding democratic institutions, puts us in a really precarious position. So um, it, it, yeah, so yes, I think it could happen. Um, I don't, I can't predict if it, if it will, but certainly so, there's certainly gross, uh, you know, human rights violations that I think we also have. I think there was a question over here and then we'll take up the other. My question is to Dr. Magurdicha. So yesterday um, during the Q&A session um, of Tanner Ekutum, um, I asked the question about if he thought that if Erdogan's rule ended and the opposition came to, um, to the leadership, the government, if he thought that a recognition process could begin in Turkey. And he said that he was very uh, pessimistic about 
ever acknowledging that there was an uh, Armenian genocide. But my question is really related to like the subtle forms of uh, genocide denial that take place in our own kind of um, institutions. For example, as I said yesterday, I work here. Um, I work on the Armenian genocide denial uh, and I'm an affiliate faculty member of the Melikian Center. And two years ago, uh, when I presented uh, my uh, paper on the, what I call the regime of epistemic injustice, Turkey's regime of epistemic injustice, where I bring like the philosophical literature on epistemic injustice with Turkish denial. And I talk about institutional, ideological, and individual levels of denialism. I had a gentleman, a scholar, senior scholar here, uh, American scholar, uh, during the Q&A, he asked me this question, why are you calling it a genocide? And I was really struck. I had just explained, you know, for 30 minutes, the three levels of, uh, different levels of genocide denialism that is taking, you know, place. And this, this you know, uh, scholar from ASU uh, asked me this question, and that is that is denialism to my. But you know, I tried to respond to him, but of course, I was I was very angry, so I, I couldn't. I don't think I really did a good job. So, what to do in those cases where you like denialism comes from a very unexpected place? This is not some Turkish person. This is an American gentleman who is a senior, uh, you know, uh, faculty member. I mean, well, I'm sure you have maybe uh, come across or, or these kinds of situations. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's you have to look at kind of the arc of it again. Uh, I think in America, just taking a look at denialism in America, that it was much more active and much more vocal in the academic community probably 20 or 30 years ago. In other words, it was just outright denial. And then it's taken a more nuanced position. In other words, distortion and, and sort of more nuanced, which allows people to avoid the use of the word, of course, is so problematic, right? Genocide, because that already, you try to get around it. Our presidents have tried to get around it. So I see that, of course, it's it's there. And, and people can 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 try to nuance it, even to the extent of saying, you know, is that really a genocide? And so it, it's it's kind of shocking, yeah, it is, but it's still there, that's for sure. Yeah, I think th this can just lead into one of the things that I think we wanted to talk yeah. about a little bit, which was um, this idea of um, sort of the um, of denial of other things besides genocide, um, and I think also the role of scholars in um, in uh, genocide um, in genocide denial. Um, I just thought it would. It, um, Deborah Lipstadt is one of the sort of you know big names in, in the study of Holocaust um, denial. And one of the things she says is to never get into a debate with a Holocaust denier because Holoca Holocaust deniers tend to know more about the Holocaust than the average person. They spend a lot of time studying this event that's never happened, that supposedly never happened, so that they can get in an, an argument with somebody and in, in that way so doubt, right? So there's this creation of an idea that there's two sides of the story, right? That there, there's a creation of an idea that, that scholars disagree about um, about what happened in these different time periods, and the fact is that scholars don't scholars don't disagree. Real scholars don't disagree about the historical facts. They they might disagree about how to interpret um, certain things, but they don't. But real scholars don't disagree about the fact that either the Armenian genocide happened or that the, or the Holocaust happened. Um, I think maybe we'll pick up a little bit more on, on other kinds of denial in a minute, but I don't know if yeah. you want to speak to me. No, I'll come back to it, yeah. Let's... I think Jacob, you were next, and, and then there's a whole lot of other questions. Uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Kushman, you mentioned the fact that um, you know, in modern times, the, the, the internet, especially the Holocaust denial, has taken on new, new forms. And I think you raised also mentioned that, that the generation of survivors and witnesses are now passing away. We have less and less of them every day. I've, I've studied Harry Mazal about the chat case, and his big concern was the academic working nature of some of the early, you know, F, F files and, and the, the dissertation style, the 
as my question kind of relates to that as we enter a world without subscribers as we enter a world where you feel like they can do whatever they want with information and make themselves an expert um obviously you don't want to engage um you know, Dakota, um, science to go to college campuses and kind of open debate. So, without confronting uh, these people and calling them out, and this, this is a question you might have issued on that Armenian case too. What are some other tools we have now as the world gets, as the information world gets more complex and students are just as likely to come across and Google or all across valid information versus the really convincing looking complete lies? Yeah, well, I think one thing that we as scholars learn how to do is we we don't like, we only we don't only look at the footnotes and see that there's footnotes there, but we actually go look at the we we look at you know sometimes we go and look at you know what those sources actually are, right? So does the source say what this person says the source says, and who wrote this source? So one of the things we find among Holocaust deniers is that the, these ones that have the sophisticated looking dissertations or whatever, their their footnotes are filled with other Holocaust deniers. Right. So they don't have they're not they're not quoting like you or me or some of the people in this room. They're 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 referring to each other. So one thing so one thing I would say is that we do our we do our scholarly due diligence and we look at the sources that 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 people are looking at. If we look at the sources, then what we see that what we see is that the Holocaust happened. Right. Um, the other thing. Um, what else do I want to say? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to do about um, the internet. I don't know if anybody. I don't know if anybody is. Um, the you know it's interesting. I just remember, um, you know, a few years ago, um, uh, there was somebody. Somebody wrote you know something on the on their Facebook page about all the great things that um, that a former president um, had done, and um, and then somebody asked them, oh, did you did you check the sources? And they said, of course. Well, I checked three. I checked three of the. I did check fact checked three of the facts and they were all they were all wrong so it's sort of so I don't know I don't know what you do with that check the sources and I guess look I guess the other thing I would say is learn how to learn how to read critically like look at what is the argument the person is making why are they making that who are they when did they write this what kinds of things shape the thing you know what kinds of things are shaping and I think these are these are these are skills that we need not only in reading a text but in reading a, a Holocaust film, in reading a Holocaust photograph, in reading a document that's produced by um, the, you know, um, the Einsatzgruppe and the kill mobile killing squads. These are all skills that we need to be, I think, um, not only historians or scholars, but also to be sort of, you know, well-informed um, citizens of, uh, uh, in this country. So are, are we going to do, are we moving in that direction? I don't really get that sense, but, uh, you know, I guess we just keep trying. <laughs> I would just I would just add in the case of the Armenian genocide, the significant difference is that the denial continues mm -hmm. on a state level. Right. So the, here you have Turkey, whose entire government apparatus is is working towards denialism. So you get very legitimate academicians, academics in the United States that I've seen in person who will you know give that argument. Don't get into the argument, but here they are producing that argument in those panels, and so. You have to you have to stand up to it. You have to you have to combat it. But it makes it that much more difficult when the state of Turkey has not acknowledged it. So, okay. would you like to? So, thank you Sorry. very much for your presentation. I really found them quite informative and helpful. Um, I just have one very short question for each of you. So, uh, so for you, um, and looking at that timeline, which I really appreciate, um, could you contextualize for us kind of? After 2003 in this period, the fact that we did and you reference that we did have two you know, recent US presidents, right? So we have one with the Obama administration, which never actually used the G word, uh, and, and it was excoriated for that. Um, and then Biden, we did. Um, but that, there seems to be a kind of a muted response in some ways to that. So I was hoping you could kind of contextualize in your time periods, like why that might have been the case. Um, and then for you, which is kind of dovetails with your question about technology. Um, is that it has been used in ways that, that, that perpetuate denialism of the Holocaust, but also been opportunities to try to combat that. And one way in which that's happened is through the holograms that we've had of a lot of different survivors and trying to not just supplement the video text, but through living individuals who at some point will not be living anymore. Um, and I was wondering um, within the, the, the narrative of denialism, like where those kinds of technologies or where technology is actually helping combat that. 
Well, in response to the question about presidents, I mean, I think we put entirely too much too much weight on what the president said in the case of the Armenian genocide, simply because we're trying to affirm it. Then since 1975, we, that is Armenians, have tried to have the United States government affirm the genocide. So then you get into the whole euphemisms, as you mentioned. So use the Armenian word for genocide, yeren, crime, rather than use the word genocide because it's a politically loaded word. Um, as to why President Biden chose at the moment he did to do it, it's it's still a little bit problematic for me. I, I can't really pinpoint the exact reason that he may have done it. I'm, I'm certainly happy that he did that. I think it's very positive. And if you read the you read the what the Congress passed, it's a very positive, uh, very positive idea that it's for education to prevent it uh, happening in the future. I think we need to really ramp up the education on all genocides, Holocaust. I mean, we're 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 really behind the ball, eight ball on that one. But um, it's just that I, I think there was a, a moment in the United States where President Biden has felt that you know there is this movement and that he wanted to capitalize, maybe for his own political reasons, maybe not. But um, I th I think that's it. Yeah. So about the uh, um, hologram technology um, and it, whether it's helping to combat denialism, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think in some ways it might be too soon to tell. Um, I think they're really interesting technologies. I think they're um, there and they're, uh, there's also starting to be the development of virtual reality. Um, uh, I, um, I feel like I'm sort of agnostic about both the both um, things. I think that there are some things that could be positive. Um, and but there's also some downsides. And I think um, in terms of in terms of positives, I think the the hologram gives um, people who will never have a chance to interact with a Holocaust survivor um, some kind of um, some kind of opportunity to to do that. Um, that said, I'm not sure. I mean, I feel like it's been like having having an interaction, hearing a Holocaust survivor give their testimony. Is has been such a powerful part of Holocaust education for for quite a while now, um, but I'm not I, I'm not convinced that that's the only or maybe even the best way to learn about the Holocaust. Um, so, I think to to be seen um, in terms of the. Uh, in terms of the, so I think I think they're interesting, and I get, I think they give they present opportunities. Um, in terms of the downside, I think um, one of the big pro things that I find problematic with the with the holograms in particular is that there's su it's such a there's such a recent technology. Um, one of the things that's already happened is they're recent technology, but they're already almost kind of obsolete. Um, and uh, because they were later technology, what that means is that the, the survivors who were alive when that technology was implemented are people who, who were of a certain age at the time that the Holocaust took place. So there's a whole sort of, um, a whole range of, of Holocaust experiences that aren't, that didn't get captured in the, um, in the, in the holograms. Um, they're, they're captured in other places um, in memoir, in um, the USC Shoah Foundation, and other repositories of uh, of oral history and video history testimonies, um, so they're they're they are available out there. Um, it, yeah, memoirs, diaries, and and you know and and documents from the time, uh, and so on. Um, but they're not there. So if that, so I would say it, it's it's one tool for people to get access to this history. But I I would caution against using it as the only tool. For sure. Maybe we can bundle a few questions. So Mr. Koga, one of our wonderful musicians from last night, uh, thank you for being here. So, and, and one of our wonderful students. So maybe we can bundle the question and you can see what, which one uh, you want to engage. Would you like to go first? Certainly. The uh, question I want to throw out is with regards to social media and going backing, which you touched on briefly. Uh, I'm active in social media, and it's very obvious that the anti-Semitic posts and accounts that exist are tied very closely with bots, with uh, troll accounts, uh, they're government sponsored, and there's a very tight link with them, uh, that network with pro-Russian trolls and accounts. Any thoughts on that? That's, that's funny, would, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, 
Uh, so this is for Dr. Cushman and those of you that I think um, I think part of the struggle is uh, is to first communicate, first to just actually bring up the topic of genocide, mm -hmm. not to share that with people. And then the second part that's difficult is to when you do bring it up, to bring it up responsibly. So one of the big things on the internet, or or just initially the thing that uh, exposes younger people to this kind of topics is entertainment. So whether it be movies or TV shows, or uh, in, in the case that I've seen for uh, younger people is video games. And when it comes to video games, um, I would say that there is almost no representation historically on Armenian genocide. <laughs> and I would say that there is irresponsible uh, representation. Because when you, uh, when you portray Hitler as this comedic ninja kind of person, it really devalues the reality of what it was historically. So I guess the question is, um, do you think the efforts, is there any kind of responsible effort to portray this properly in video games? And is it even worth trying to go that route because of the, the downside of, of the theaters? One last question in this round and then um, so talking about how governments should learn from their past, there are two different views of understanding internal cultural and society um, in both of these examples. The first one is where the Turkish government said everybody's a Turk, and the other one, you were talking about the steps for Holocaust classification. So how do democratic societies, how should they start to begin to understand their internal cultural makeup in and just as the first steps of, of creating those societies and making sure that there isn't the division that happens when there is classification or the denial that happens when there is homogenization. Well, and that's an interesting question because uh, what happened in Turkey is that actually Armenians and Greeks were being classified up until very recently in their passports. There were secret codes which would tell who was an Armenian and who was a Greek. So, I mean, uh, the idea of, of Opening it up, I mean, you really have to get to a democratic society. I think that's where I would see with Turkey is when Turkey becomes more democratic, I think the chances of acknowledgement will, will go very high because, because that's the way to break down those barriers. It, it's those classifications, very easy now in Turkey, you know, to blame Armenians or to, to use Armenians, but you've got to eliminate that from, from that, I think. I don't know if yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what to say about that. I have to think about that a little bit. Um, I was thinking about um, in terms, so I am, I don't know, uh, so I'm not a super active social media um, user, uh, nor, um, uh, nor do I play video games. That said, I think, so for social media, one of the things I understand about social media, and maybe this is a misunderstanding of social media, is that there's an algorithm that causes, that makes it so that you and I, when we say like, oh, I'm interested in this, it'll start feeding us more of that. So it seems to me like a simple solution would be to change the algorithm. Um, Talk now, mask. Right. <laughs> right, so, I mean, that's it. Like if, if someone, if you feel like if someone really wanted to put some effort into thinking about how to make it so that we're not, not all like sort of confirming our own, you know, biases, that we could change, that somebody could figure out how to change the algorithm. I mean, if they, they made it, they can't, they, they can change it, right? I mean, I think. So that would be one, that would be one solution. In terms of video games and sort of how do we, how do we um, think about sort of, um, you know, responsible um, representation of, I, gosh, I don't, I don't know. I'm not a person who's in favor of, of, of censorship, really. I, I, I think this idea, I, I hate the, I hate the marketplace of idea, like marketplace kind of bothers me, but this idea of like exchange of ideas and then like sort of the best idea kind of, or the best ideas are maybe get talked about more. I, I kind of like that. Um, but I don't know how you do that in a video game. Um, so, uh, Gosh, I don't know. Maybe it's a broader discussion. Maybe it needs to be a, a, a broader discussion about what, how do we how do we represent and talk about about history. Um, I don't know what kinds of video games there are that sort of you know misrepresent um, uh, slavery. It seems like the Holocaust has a particular kind of attraction for people who are interested in misrepresenting it. But um, yeah, I don't, so I don't know if that was probably a really incomprehensible answer. But uh, I I don't I don't know. 
In the case of the Armenian genocide, again, I, I think there are people actually in the room that are better uh, placed because they, they are teaching teachers how to teach the genocide. And so I think you have to develop any way that you can that's age appropriate and that works. Why not? I mean, you know, uh, I'm not opposed to video games. I don't know that there are any about the Armenian genocide, but I, I don't I think you have to communicate at the level of the of the audience. And if you you can do that and get it in an accurate way, then then you do it. Of course, there's going to be, you know, anything else going on, too, but uh, meaning denialism and et cetera. But you have to you still have to go ahead with what, what you know. I think we have time for one more question. I got a, I got a question kind of, kind of when it comes to technology. With the new chat bot GBT, I'm just curious if you run across where this might be an exercise for students, because I'd be really curious about this. I know how you put in the parameters and how to define like writing a paper with it, but you ask one group to say, you know, write a paper on the Holocaust. And then you ask another group to say, use, use the bot to write a paper denying the Holocaust. And then compare and contrast the two and see, because it's it's chasing information, you know, in the metaverse. I'd just be curious to see you know, what the results are. I would be curious to see the results too. But my guess is that the papers would be very similar. <laughs> like that's my that's my supposition, but I don't know because the, the you know it doesn't the chat the the bots don't sort information right they just sort of gather the most prolific information and then put it there. So for students who are thinking about writing their paper with chatbot, it's a it's not a good idea because they get a lot of the information is wrong. Um, so again, check your sources. Um, you know some of those classic techniques we use, I think, are still they're still worthwhile. Um, so I don't, I don't know, I'd be curious. So if somebody does that in their class, I'd love to. I think the avoid topics like, well, not avoid topics, but like against racism, it's programmed against sexism and these kind of things. I think if you um, ask it to deny the Holocaust, I mean, I don't know. It wouldn't. It wouldn't deny the Yeah, because I, I, um, I personally was interested in finding facts about book bans and like who would approve of it. It talked about book bans in general, but it also said that um, denying, like approving of book bans, it's not something it can talk about, but it can give you like opinions people have said. So there's probably the same thing. All right, I think we have time for one more. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, my question is to, um, what's the connection between modern nationalism and genocide, and if you can, that, that's the big question that concerns me. But if you can take the Armenian and the Syrian genocides, yesterday we had a conversation about the Syrian genocide. Can you say what's what do they have in common and where they differ from each other? The Syrian and the Armenian. Well, they have much in common because they lived in the same uh, area, in the same region, in the same empire. So the targeting was pretty much uh, similar. It seems that the Armenian. Uh, the Armenians were targeted at a higher level in the sense of the propaganda and the uh, the laws that were developed to cover that action. To me, it seems like it was more of that, whereas in the case of the Assyrians, it was probably, I'm going to use the term cruder uh, methodology that was used, because Armenians lived throughout the entire Ottoman Turkish Empire, and so they were targeted from cities very far away from you know war zones, because they, they said, we're going to deport Armenians they, you know, from the Black Sea all the way down into the death camps. So that's, you know, hundreds of miles away, whereas the Assyrian population was more located in the south, southwestern portions. So, I mean, there's that, those similarities, I think. Uh, but again, they were both targeted with the same sort of rhetoric. And, and you know, you have to be, you have to be Turkish. That's pan-Turkism. And I think that ideology, that nationalism is also what was motivated earlier, asked the question about what's happening today. And that's, that's the extreme nationalism that's being promulgated in Azerbaijan. I believe. But in modern Iraq, the story is different than in modern Turkey. Yeah, I'm not. So, I'm not that. So yeah. That's that's the problem. So that's why I'm trying to yeah. kind of get get a handle. What what is it? Is it the need to kind of isolate the other or to other? If you use it as a verb, to other other groups and and make the modern national identity against something else 
even though that something else is part of the society. Is that some dynamic here? Well, I mean, you have to look at Kurds too. I mean, Kurds would probably be your best example because uh, Kurds are Muslim, but yet they're different than, than Turks. And yet they were categorized as mountain, you know, Turks. They were euph euphemisms used for it. So it's an entire very interesting topic. I mean, it's it's really the, the one of the core issues, right? Is how to, how to deal with that nationalism and how we otherize others, <laughs> otherize others, but we we categorize them and push them into these categories. But it's not inevitable. I mean, it wasn't in, it was not inevitable in the First World War. It, the genocide was not inevitable. There are any number of ways it could have gone, but the war was always a cover. Uh, for for genocide as well, so yeah, I'm, I don't have the answer, but it's a yeah, it's a good question. Maybe next year we'll take a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that'd be good. Well, please uh, join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.